The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you joined us today, and we trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again to the pages of Scripture to allow the Word of God to teach us uh, things here that uh, you wouldn't understand, know, and be able to uh, uh, evaluate any other way. The Spirit of God teaches us through the, the excellency of His Word, and it's the excellency of the power of His Word that works in us to give us a comprehension of what God's doing. And when Paul talks about that we might be able to comprehend uh, we, the, the, the love of Christ, the length, the breadth, the depth, and, 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 and to know the love of Christ, and to be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And God's desire is for, for the believer to be filled with, to have his life controlled by the fullness of God, by the love and grace of God provided for us in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you begin to understand that and see that and rejoice in that, you understand something about how to, how to make God's Word the issue in your life. Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. In other words, there are divisions and distinctions in God's Word that you need to make and that you need to recognize. One of the, one of the most common things that you hear when you hear people talk about the Bible is, is about uh, uh, a, a so-called general resurrection and general judgment. In fact, there's a whole doctrine of, of people, the majority of Christendom caught up in uh, theological confusion, in, in a doctrine that uh, often is called preterism. That is the idea that all of the Bible, the prophecy of the Bible has already been fulfilled, and all that's left perhaps is one last general resurrection where everybody's resurrected, and then everybody is judged. In your Bible, if you think something like that is true, you'll be con con continuously confused. In God's Word, there are at least seven distinct, separate judgments. Now, when you think about that, you begin to say, wow, <laughs> if, 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 your, if your religion tells you there's only one general resurrection, one general judgment, and then in the Bible there are seven of them, you begin to say, wow, you know, I, maybe... Maybe that's the reason there's a lot of confusion. Let's go over them together. I, I just want to be able to spend just a little bit of time being sure that, that we, we talk about and understand some of these things. Every, you know, we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. Every, every, we talk about the program of God for Israel, the program of God for the body of Christ, the program revealed in the mystery program, the pro, program revealed in prophecy, program of the earth, program of the heavens. And though, that, that's the basic division in your Bible. But there are a lot of other things along that line that need to be laid out upon that timeline. And one of them is the issue of, of judgment. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. The very first one of these judgments that you have to understand is the fact that Jesus Christ at Calvary, sin and sins were judged at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before the, before the cross work, before the Lord Jesus Christ died, he talked about the cross, the cross, his cross as being a, a time of, of judgment. When Jesus Christ died at Calvary, our sin and our sins were judged there. God made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, the Bible says that God made him a propitiation. A propitiation in the Bible. That's a good Bible word. You don't use that word a lot maybe in your vocabulary uh, in, in our day. But then, I mean, you know, the vocabulary of the average American today, or the average citizen of the planet today, is grossly inadequate for, uh, uh, for any kind of real expression. 
That's the way cursing and, and, and vile talk is so popular because people don't have any more creative ways of, of expressing their anger and their, their uh, uh, disdain as to just be able to get in the gutter. Uh, there was a day when those kind of words weren't uh, frequented like they are today because people had a little more versatile vocabulary. <laughs> Well, propitiation, in, in the Bible, that's, that's, a, that's a word in the Bible that has a very special meaning. Um, and, you know, when you study the Bible, you expect the Bible to have me, words that affect, its, you know, words that are common to it. If you, uh, if you were a mechanic and you learned to be a mechanic, you'd, you'd learn about carburetors and clutch plates and transmissions and, and, and valve lifters and, and piston rods and crankshafts and all that stuff. And for most of us, those things don't mean anything. But those are words that are particular to a particular vocation. And you don't get mad at a mechanic because he knows that. If you're a plumber, you'd know a bunch of words connected with plumbing. And if you're, you know, you're a cook, you'd know a lot of kind of words connected with your, 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 uh, uh, profession that outsiders might not know. So when you come to the Bible, you expect it to have words. You don't, you know, you don't get mad about it because it uses words you didn't know. You find out what they mean. And a propitiation means a fully satisfying sacrifice. Jesus Christ had, the, had our sins placed on him there, and God completely and totally and forever judged your sin at Calvary. The wages of sin is death. So Jesus Christ died for our sins, then he was buried and rose again because the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ, when he died at Calvary, paid for your sins. He was bearing your sins, my sins, our sins. And he bore them there on the tree, and God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says he, that um, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did destroy deem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, the, the judgment of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into our own way. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. In that passage originally, when that passage was written, it was talking about the nation of Israel. But you and I know through the ministry revealed to the Apostle Paul that he didn't just die for Israel. He died for the sins of all men. And when Jesus Christ died at Calvary, he put away sin. The sacrifice, one sacrifice forever. One sacrifice put away all of our sins forever. He doesn't need to do it over and over and over again. You don't need to re-sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ. What he did at Calvary when he said it's finished, it's done. And so sin was, 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 was completely judged paid for, taken care of, and, the, and, and he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 10, the writer says, by the which will, talking about the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering oft times, oft times, uh, often, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. If you have to offer the sacrifice over and over and over and over, it's because it didn't get the job done. Once the job's done, you don't have to keep doing it. But this man, after he hath offered one sacrifice for sin forever sat down on the right hand of God from hence expecting till his enemy made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If you're still trying to do something or have a priest do something for you to get your sins forgiven, it's because what they're doing doesn't get the work done. Jesus Christ offered one sacrifice that took care of all sins forever, so he went and sat down. The work's finished. Sins are judged at Calvary. That's the first judgment. You've got to get that one. Because all the rest of them are nothing compared to that. Now, when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and, and you, you, begin, you, you trust Him, and you, you've made Him your Savior, and you become a member of the church, the body of Christ, as you walk through life... You need to, you, 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 you've given them privilege to bring this identity that God has given you into the experience of your life. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 
number 11. And you'll notice where the Apostle Paul talks about another judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So there is a, there is a judgment that we, we talk about, we judge ourselves. That is, we evaluate ourselves. We look at what we're doing. And when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not uh, be condemned with the world. So there's, there's a, as sinners, our sins are judged at the cross. We get a new identity as members of the church, the body of Christ. And then in our walk on a daily basis as sons, now we're his sons, you're a sinner back here, and as a sinner, you're judged at Calvary. As a son, you're judged every day. It's your responsibility to apply the identity that God gives you in your life. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. By the way, when he says when, you, when you're going to judge yourself, that's, that's got nothing to do with, with going and trying to confess your sins. <laughs> you know, 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not an excuse for some kind of a confessional where you go to some religious uh, a priest or a pastor or something and you confess your sins. That's not you looking at God and saying, Oh, Lord, I want, you, I want to confess my sins that I've... So you'll forgive me. That verse is a, is a salvation verse. He says, if we confess our sins, talking to the nation Israel, John's writing to the circumcision, and he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many times can you be cleansed from all unrighteousness? This one time, or it wasn't all of them. That verse is telling Israel what was required of them in order to be saved in their system. That's why they go out to, in, 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 for example, in Matthew 3, they go out to John the Baptist confessing their sins and are baptized of him. What's that got to do with it? It's got to do with how the nation Israel was to be redeemed from the captivity and the wrath of God against them that put them out into, into Babylonian and, and, and Gentile captivity. Go back and read Leviticus 26. And that's what John is is pressing them about. It's going to be through their Messiah and what he did for them at Calvary that they're going to get their sins forgiven. That's not about you and me today. You and I have our sins forgiven at Calvary. As far as everything that has to do with you as a sinner is taken care of, now as a son, you walk in the identity that is given you, and one of the things you do is you are careful. Titus chapter 2. Time's going to mean we're going to have to forget, skip Philippians. Come over to Titus chapter, chapter 2. <laughs> I understand I get to teach and I get to go on and I got seven of these things to go through and they just held up a sign to me and told me we, we didn't have that much time left. So <laughs> I'll move on a little bit. Take the engine and hook the caboose a little closer to it. Titus chapter 2, don't miss this. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. How do you deny ungodliness and worldly lust? That is, on a daily basis, I look at my life and I say, there is sin. I'm going to evaluate what's going on in my life. You say, how do I do that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. There is reproof. There are things in my life that need to be fixed. There's reproof. I need to be rebuked for something. It isn't, that doesn't belong in my life. I, deny, I need to deny its activity. That's the thing. You see, that's what the cross teaches you, that Christ put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So what I do as a, as a son is I take my life and I bring it under the scrutiny of God's word and I find the things that don't match the identity that I have in him and I say, you don't belong in my life. And I'm going to live soberly, righteously, and godly. I'm going to take these, I'm going to have my life under the constant Watch care and scrutiny of God's Word. That's that daily self-judgment. 
And that's how you get rid of careless living in the Christian life. You don't get rid of careless living by telling people, well, if you live that way, God won't save you. Listen, you get, them, you get people to, live, to live, walk circumspectly like say, by saying, this is who God made you. And when you find things in your life that don't match who God made you in Jesus Christ, deny them access to your life because he's put them away. That's what the cross was about. And put in their place. Put off the old, put on the new. So there's self-judgment. This goes on in the heart of the believer. It's our walk in time right now where this takes place. Now, one day the dispensation of grace is going to be over with. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and take us to be with him. And when we meet him in the air, there's a thing called the judgment seat of Christ. Now that has to do with your service. You're going to face him and it's going to be your service. You're, as a, you're going to be judged not as, a, not as a sinner and not as a son, but as a, as a servant. Your, your ministry, your life, your service back here going to be evaluated up there. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. The time of this is at the, at the meeting in the air when we meet the Lord. The place is when we meet Him in the air. Caught up with the Lord, we meet Him in the air. 1 Corinthians 4 verse number 5, He says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Your and, and me appearing before the judgment seat of Christ to have our stewardship of, of, of our life down here evaluated for, and for the service we're going to have in the future takes place right there at that judgment seat of Christ. It's called, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and you'll see that terminology. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this verse is, is extremely important because it tells you what's going to happen there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is believers. No unbeliever is going to be here. Only members of the body of Christ are going to be there. How do you get in the body of Christ? You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you trust Jesus Christ exclusively, God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam, puts you into Christ, imputes to you His righteousness, and gives you His identity. Puts his life in you, and you on a daily basis through time can take that, that word of God that, he, that, that he's given you, understand who it is God's made you in Christ, and bring that into the realities of your life, present you, your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And when you, one day the dispensation of grace will be over, we face him at the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to be evaluated based upon how our life down here grew and who we were. How, how much growing up did you do in the family? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, everybody wants Christians to be judged. The Lord himself is going to be, be the judge. That verse we read in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, I don't care what other people think of me. Don't judge anything before the time. The Lord <laughs> will do the judging. And he's going to do it right there when he comes. We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now watch. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to whether he, what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Notice that what you receive up here when your service is judged is what you did in your body. Right here at the judgment seat of Christ for believers, the things you did back here in your inner man are going to go with you. Your old man's going to, you're, you're going to drop your body. Your physical body, the earthly house of this tabernacle, is going to be dissolved. You're going to get a new glorified body right here at the resurrection. The part of you that goes with you is your soul, your inner man. The, edif the, the building up. You see, that's why it isn't, the ministry is not just putting warm bodies in cold pews. People have the idea that, that the church is the building, and to build the church, to edify the church, you just get more people in the building. That's not it. The church is the believer. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the church. And to build up the church is to build up the believer, is to have Christ formed in your inner man. Now, the, 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 the level to which Christ is formed in your inner man here is what's going to be, that's what you're going to receive up there. You're going to receive the thing done in your body. In other words, you're going to receive a status statement from the Lord himself about your maturity level, 
and your capacity to serve him in the heavenly places out here. It'll be based upon your sonship walk here, how much you develop in your, your, your life as a son, how grown up you become, and then it'll be declared for you right there. And the Lord himself is going to give you that reward. It's called the reward of inheritance. The Lord himself is going to... So all of our... You know, we sing that song, It Will Be Worth It All, when we see Jesus. All the things you say... Listen, you go through things as a believer right now. You take it in the neck for serving him sometime. And you don't see any, immediately re any immediate reward for it. You see the world out there get rewarded. You see religion get rewarded. And you say, what about me? The Lord says, I'm going to take care of you. Just learn. The sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. He says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Quit trying to get rid of all your problems and live in those problems in the victory that God already gave you in Christ. Let them be the stage that he intended them to be, for the, 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 the stage where you live, where he lives through you, and his strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you do that, that capacity to do that is what gets rewarded out there. Now, after we leave the planet, the earth continues on. There's a time of period in here called the tribulation period. And that tribulation period is a time when the judgment of God on the nation Israel takes place. Israel rejected her Messiah, and there's some wrath of God that's going to come upon Israel. There's a time of wrath and tribulation and judgment that will come upon the nation Israel. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter number 30, Jeremiah chapter 30, he says, for alas, that, that day is great, talking about this period of time in the trib here, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he should be saved out of it. And they shall serve the Lord, their king, and David, the Lord their God, and David their king. Jesus Christ is going to come back over here and set up his kingdom. But before he does that, there's going to be the judgment of God on the nation Israel. And in that judgment, what he's going to do, he's going to purge out the rebel, and only redeemed Israel gets to go into that kingdom. What that tribulation period with the Antichrist and, and the judgments of God and so forth are about, the place is Palestine, the nation Israel, the land of Israel. The time is the tribulation. The result is you're going to get a holy nation coming out of that, redeemed Israel, and you're going to get that redeemed nation that comes out who can be the nation that receives the kingdom. There's that judgment. First one's Calvary. Second one is our, our self-judgment. Third one is the judgment seat of Christ. Fourth is the judgment of Israel, the tribulation. Then there's the judgment of the Gentiles, the judgment of the nations. It takes place when Jesus Christ comes back, sits upon the throne of his glory, Matthew 25, and before him gather all the nations, and he takes some into the kingdom, and he puts some of them down into hell. And that Gentile, the, the judgment of the nations takes place during that 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins at his second advent. The place is the earth earth, the time is the, is the, is the kingdom, and the, 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 uh, the people are the Gentiles. Now that's the fifth one. Then after the, the thousand years, Revelation chapter 20 says that the heaven and earth flee away, and that sixth judgment is what's called the great white throne judgment out here. And this is where all the lost, all the damned come before him and, are, and face the judgment and then they're cast off into the lake of fire. That judgment right there and also at that time is when he judges the angelic creation that fell Satan and his angels at fall. This, is, this great white throne judgment here, the lost appear there and the angelic lost appear there and they're cast into the lake of fire. And that judgment is what puts death and hell into the lake of fire. And after that, you have the new heaven and the new earth because the sin issue is over with. Understand, these are different. Don't take the cross and mix it with this. Don't take our judgment seat of Christ and make it that. If you think there's only one judgment in the Bible, you haven't really thought about judgment in the Bible. You see, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to wind up confusing. You're going to wind up thinking the great white throne judgment is you. You're going to wind up thinking that God's judgment on the Gentiles over here is what he's doing today. You're going to think he's, his judgment on Israel, he's through with Israel. You're not going to understand how your walk is affected today. All those things are critical 
to gathering and understanding of what God is accomplishing today. And they all start right here. If you don't get the first one cor correct, the rest of them won't make any difference. If you don't get it, get it clear in your understanding that it, when Jesus Christ went to Calvary, he went there to pay for everything that's wrong with you. So that when you rely exclusively upon him, not him and the church, not him and your commandment keeping, not him and your efforts, but exclusively upon Jesus Christ, who was God that became man, so that he could go to Calvary and die for your sins. God commended his love toward us in the way we were yet sinners. You weren't trying to fix it. Jesus Christ died for you. He was buried. He was raised again the third day, that having put away your sin, he could then give you his life. You see, the Christian life is not you living according to rules, regulations, rites, and ceremonies. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Jesus Christ giving you his life because you have his righteousness. And then that life living through you as you walk by faith and an understanding of his word. And it's the effectual working of that truth of his word that works in the details of your life, that transforms your mind, changes, renews your mind, and transforms your overt behavior because there's a new life inside that works out through, changes your attitudes, and then changes your actions because of his word working in you. That starts out, all of it begins with life begins at Calvary, where Jesus died for sins. Your life will never begin until you come to Calvary and trust Him. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time, Maranatha.